to another episode of MJ's Progress Not Perfection. Today's guest is Shannon. Um, Shannon is the first person that I've talked to that I didn't know from New Jersey um, that happened to have all of her using days there. And a lot of her stories had to do with Camden. Um, just be ready for some, you know, intense stories, that's for sure. Um, she's been through a lot. And she's doing good now. She's on the right track. She's, you know, working a program. She's doing everything she wasn't doing before. Because as she says, she was a chronic relapser. And we get into all that pretty much right away. So enjoy the show. Yeah, I can hear you fine, so that's good. Okay, good, good. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, don't feel like you have to rush. Like, if we if it's like one thirty, and we're still going, like... I, we could always just like pause it for 10 minutes while it's literally I'm running down the block, half a block down okay. to, get, to get size for my brother's wedding. And then I'll be back again within 10 minutes. They're like, it takes five minutes. So like if we have to pause it, you know, then we have to pause it. But if you're done, then we're done. You know, some of these take okay. a half an hour. Some of them take two. Some have taken three. So I don't <laughs> want you to feel like you're rushing. You know what I mean? Just be comfortable at your own pace. All right. So, okay. yeah. Welcome to the show, Shannon. I appreciate you know taking some time to talk. So, no problem. Thank how you much for clean? Me. How much clean time do you have? Uh, so this time I have changed my clean date. I used to be a chronic relapser. Um, this time around today, I believe I have five day, five months and four days. With that being said, I have had sufficient clean time and relapsed with sufficient clean time. What is sufficient so clean sponsor, time to you? Um, well, I've relapsed with five years. I've relapsed after three years, um, 18 months. And my sponsor tells me I don't lose what I've learned. I just changed my clean date. And I definitely have a lot in my bag of what doesn't work, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I... And I, <laughs> for and I and I agree with that because it's not necessarily things that we learn that make us relapse. It's things that we stop paying attention to that we learn that causes, you know, relapse. Usually, you know, we stop going to meetings, we stop calling our sponsor, we stop doing the work, you know, oh, it, you know, we're going to get into it. So, yeah. we'll, so say you, you know, you're an addiction and you have all the money in the world. What was the drug you were buying? Like your drug of choice when money wasn't an option? Um. Wait, you oh. froze. Wait, you froze on me for a second there, Shannon. That's drug. Wait, you froze on me. Um, I was saying, what was your drug of choice, you know, when you had the money? Okay. Am I good? Hear yeah. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, cocaine was my drug of choice. Okay. I also um, suffered from addiction to opiates as well. Um, they went hand in hand for me. I did, I do have, um, gosh, I'd have to really like pull out the calendar, but I believe like 15 years clean from cocaine. And I do believe that I would be dead today had I not stopped doing that. Yeah. Okay. So was that your first like drug of choice then was coke? Um, so I've, I've used everything, you know. Everything, you know, anything and everything that was there, and I've tried. Um, but that was the main drug that could take me out of myself and to that place of not caring, not feeling. That was the only one that could do it. Okay. Now, how did this all start? Like when you were a teenager, or did you get into drinking first, or because you know, um, I know how it is in Jersey. <laughs> Okay, so I used to be like a major pothead all through school. Um, I had some life situations, like like I, I think um, it definitely runs in my family genetically. Um, and I began on Percocet actually from a doctor uh, for migraine, and. Uh, he was giving me way too many, way too many. You know, I was suffering maybe four or five migraines 
like incapacitating migraines a month. But yet he was giving me enough Percocet for like two or three a day for 30 days, you know? Yeah. Um, I was, I guess I would say like socially using cocaine and crack cocaine with friends as much as you could socially use something like that. <laughs> um, and I had friends that were already um, heroin addicts and uh, cocaine is a drug that makes you want more and more and more with each change. So they said, you know, I'll just do a little bit to come down, you know. And um, I started doing a little bit, not enough to get high, but just enough to, like, level out. And um, I physically became addicted. So now I'm physically addicted to the opiate, but, like, psychologically addicted to the cocaine. Okay. And it was an every day. You had to go up with one and down with the other. Correct. Yeah. How long did that go on for? Um, gosh, that went on and off for years. I remember the first time being sick, uh, like withdrawal sick. And I said, you know, I'm going to stay home. I'm feeling under the weather. And everybody was calling me. You know, I had the car and they needed rides, and so everybody's calling me, offering me money, like, I'm dumb. I said, I don't feel good, I don't want to go anywhere, and uh, my one uh, using buddy at the time was like, you're sick, you're in withdrawal, and I'm like, no, I'm not, like, don't tell me that, you know, and I sat there at home, and it played on my mind, you know, I'm like, am I, could I be, you know, and I eventually, uh, got up and went and I'll be damned if I wasn't in withdrawal and I think back and I'm like I wonder you know um, if he never told me that could I have gotten through it would I have used it again you know and like the answer is probably yes I probably would have used it again you know I eventually would have figured out what withdrawal was but I was that naive it yeah, I get. To- yeah, because that was my story. I didn't know what was happening, and I got through it. And then the next time it happened, months later, I realized like that's what happened the first time. So yeah, right. I can tell you firsthand. I went back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you don't I know. You don't know. The first you know. time. Yeah, I pulled turkey the first time, and then every time after that, I would become. Uh, I would become scared. You know, to even be in that of withdrawal um yeah it's a sca- yeah because you don't it's you feel like you literally feel like you're gonna die but yeah. it is a is a horrible feeling so when it happens you don't you want to avoid it happening again for as long as you can right um, right because how old are you while this is going on with the coke and the pills because like that's an expensive habit to have you know um i would say that i became I remember the day that I became an addict, like where it crossed the line. You know, have you ever seen the charts of the globe, you know? And uh, I remember the day that it crossed the line. And uh, I I couldn't tell you the date, but I remember the day. What happened that day? day? So, like I said, I was never doing enough of the opiates to get high. I was just doing enough to level out. And, um, so I used to, you know, make excuses to myself. Oh, like, there's just nothing else to do. I'm bored. Like, this is why I use. Um, the one day I had gotten uh, actually high from the, from the heroin. And uh, I felt freedom. Which addiction is anything but freedom. So what a crock that was you know but I felt like I was on top of the world I was untouchable I was invincible no one could hurt me you know because I had gone through trauma in my life and abuse and all that and like that was I think the day that it all changed for me like you remember but, like I, having like a feeling of like oh this is what I was feel, looking for. right right like this is wonderful, whereas 
bed? Why have I waited so long? You know, like, um, but I became an addict, um, or really, you know, delved so deep into using probably around 19 or 20. Were you working or just had friends that were dealers? I was working. I, I had always worked from, um, 14 years old I had always worked so okay. I had some money I had some credit you know and your parents went very quickly <laughs> <laughs> you and now you said it runs in your family were your parents addicts or one of them so um no actually neither one of them were themselves however um my biological father used to sell drugs and on my mother's side, um, literally, like, everybody but her and my one other aunt were alcoholics and addicts. Okay, so, yeah, you you knew at least what AA was by the time, like, you were being an um, addict, or no, not yet? Not yet. I, well, by the time I was an addict, yes, I knew what AA and NA was, because uh, I used to go to help um, one of my friends. Like I said, my friends, I was kind of the last one to become, you know, addicted and into mm-hmm. drugs. So, so I used to go to support a friend. So I had been in the meeting, but not there for myself. I would say my first meeting for myself was 22 years old. And that was for Coke, though. Um. Well, that was for both, because like I said, they really went hand in hand, but um, say I only had $10, which back in the day, that's what one cost it, you know, um, I would really battle with what to get. Like, do I not want to be sick or do I want what I really want, you know? And there were some days I would, you know, like choose my drug of choice over getting well over getting physically well yeah i mean yeah (laughs) that makes sense that makes yeah because that would only intensify i could imagine the actual withdrawals if you're like on coke like that would make the sweating obviously worse for the withdrawals from the opiates and the craving for out of this world like i crave so deeply for that feeling that the cocaine gave me now why only overdose from cocaine when did that happen um i was probably around 25 and uh had been up for a few days smoking crack with a friend and uh it got to the point like we weren't getting high anymore so i placed a call to the dealer and uh he was like yeah i got from him but it's not cooked up yet and i was like good bring it you know that's what i wanted uh i was iv so he came and you know he got the stuff ready in the room for the other person and and I went into the room and I, I into the bathroom and I knew like when I was getting it ready, like that I had put way too much in there. But I didn't care that how badly I wanted to feel that feeling. And I wasn't even done pushing it in. And thank God I didn't push the rest of it in, like real quick. Um so I stopped and I staggered out of the bathroom and I said I I could barely even talk. I uttered the words, I need help. And they said, I hit the wall in front of me. I hit the wall behind me and landed face first on the ground, like not breathing for a couple of minutes. And then woke up in like this grand mal seizure. And that day, um, the only comfort I had was, um, Seeing somebody who had passed away was there telling me I was going to be okay, that I was going to wake up, that I was, and uh, that was the only comfort I had 
They didn't call the ambulance. They didn't call the ambulance. Wait, you're frozen. Uh, Hold on. They, you said they didn't call. They didn't call an ambulance. They didn't call an ambulance. Um, all I remember, like while I was in this grand mal seizure, was the guy saying, "Oh my God, she's gonna break her neck," because my head was just smashing the grass. And uh, I remember trying to move just the slightest bit so that I was hitting my forehead and not my nose. And um, yeah, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm alive today because usually people don't come back from those kinds of overdoses. No, not uh, not at all. Is that, for that. <laughs> did um was that a wake up call for you? It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, I didn't stop using. No, not that day. Uh, it, it was shortly after though that I did stop using the cooking. So what happened that day that you started that Coke was you had enough of Coke? Um since that was like your first love, what was it that you were just like, okay, I can't do this anymore? So this one, I have to give it all to God. I had the strangest experience. And in hindsight, when I think about it, I almost feel like it was an exorcism in a sense. I uh, probably I was living in bed. I was dating a kingpin, so I had unlimited access to drugs. You were dating um, a kingpin, you said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so the access was, you know, like unlimited. And uh, the only thing was I had to go get the drugs because he couldn't be seen going to get them, you know. Uh, so he sent me out in the middle of the night to go get, you know, some more cocaine. And uh, I decided to take the bike. And I'm, like, riding down the street and literally at one of the most infamous spots in Camden, uh, for cocaine sales, uh, they happened to be closed. So I was going down to like the 24 hour spot. And, um, uh, I was, like I said, riding a bike and I felt like someone yanked my head back and like this inhumane scream that wasn't of myself, like came out of me and I was thrown to the ground and I didn't understand what happened. Like, I was like, what's going on? Like, that was so freaky. Like, I was scared to get back on the bike. I didn't want to go get drugs. I just wanted to go home. I didn't want to get high. I thought something was medically wrong with me. Maybe I had diabetes. Maybe my sugar drop. I didn't know. I had no clue. Um, so I turned around, and I walked home very slowly, and I said, I'm going to have to have a story to tell him like when I get in here about why I have nothing you know so uh I told him they weren't out you know there was cops parked out there they weren't out and that was a lot you know I never went and from that day forward I never used that again so some type of divine intervention occurred yeah uh, I'm pretty sure I know this that you're sure. talking about I, I, I've been to those it's, sets. I've been to the yeah. sets in Fairview and I've been to them off road. I know exactly yeah, a couple North of Camden. those. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Cause I grew up like literally three miles away from Camden. Like my town said okay. Camden three. I lived in Mount Ephraim. Like that's oh, where I okay. grew up. So literally like right, right there, there, right. Yeah. yeah. And actually I technically grew up in Audubon park and like my house, I could see the overpass to the Walt Whitman which when you go under that overpass is Fairview and Woodland. Right. So yeah, right. like I'm very well, we would leave the bar to go into Camden to grab some Coke to go back to the bar with, you right. know, all, all the time. So yeah, I'm, I'm very well aware of 
which that's, <laughs> I've probably Scary. been, yeah, because this was like 2007, no, 2000, yeah, 8, 2009, 2010, when I was coming yeah. around there for Coke at least, because it wasn't until yeah. 2016 or 17 when I started going there for pills, because at that time, my one of my pill guys had moved. Okay. And he would be at the bar from like 11 a.m. till 5 p.m. seven days a week, drinking at this one bar in Camden. And he would just pull up. He would come out, get in the car. He ended up dying from like cirrhosis of the liver. Um, but like you know, I saw him for years in Camden. I would be driving my cop car and most like you know. But I was always going during the day. And it was what part was it? It was down on Broadway. And it was at some random ass bar like near field. It was like so weird. It was definitely down by like Campbell's Soup area. But yeah, that was a while ago, man. Oh, okay. It's like a biker's club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's been a minute. So it's just so funny that like, you know, you're from my area, but I don't know you. You know what I mean? I'm sure oh, like but there's been like interactions like <laughs> you know what I mean like people that know me know you you know what I mean kind of thing right yeah. that's how it is in yeah. our town because I remember when I met somebody from you know our area in LA and I was telling him where I lived and he was like dude I used to get high in your Walmart's parking lot I said me too <laughs> <laughs> like we were probably in the same parking lot at the same time you know right. yeah. so no, all right fine. so that was 2006 when that happened yeah around yeah. Uh, no, it had to be later than that. Um, that had to be. Oh god. Uh, it had to be about 2000. I would say nine or ten. I'm not sure exactly. Okay. And then, then you were like, "Well, I'm just going to do opiates now instead." Yep. Yep. So it's not, yeah. it's not like you and started... And I used out. to have this, like, joke with God, like, oh, can't you take this one, too? Like, take this addiction from me, too? And, like, no, the response is, like, I got to put in some work this time, you know? I'm not going to yeah. be so cut and dry. Now, where was the dude you were dating cool with you just doing heroin instead of coke? Um, he was cool with me not doing it. He wasn't okay with him not doing it. So I still had to go, like, get it for him, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a dangerous relationship, needless to say. Um, like I said, he was a kingpin. His, him and his brothers basically ran North Camden. Um, and he had gone away for a brief time to prison and came home on IFP, but while he gone he had run at the block to one of his uh workers somebody that worked for him and uh so when he came home uh so the guy used to come to my house and drop the rent off for the block every month while he was locked up and by running the block right in the block you mean he let somebody else that sold for him sell on his block but he had to pay Correct. him rent to be able to sell on that block, like give him tribute. Right. Okay. Right. And since he was away, everyone knew that they had to pay you for him. Yeah. Yeah. So they would come drop the money off. Um, and then like the last month before he was about to come home, uh, well, actually the last two months, uh, the money wasn't right. Two months prior. And then the last month he never showed up at all. So he knew coming home, it was going to be. He was going to have to send a message. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't grow up that way. I'm not from Camden. Um, yeah. How, from how did, yeah, you're down in Lumberton. How do you, how do you meet that? Like, do you just so happen to be there? Cause like everybody would go, you know, everyone knew the sets. If you were in South Jersey right. and you were in Cook, you knew the set. So you go down there, is that like you just run into him and just like strive a conversation and it turns out you happen to be talking to this dude that's running shit? Like, um, you know, how do you yeah, meet him? Because like, you know, I met kinda. people high up in my thing, but not like, you know, consider a kingpin. Like, you know what I mean? So like, right. 
you just right, got right. lucky. That was coming straight from, straight off the boat. Straight off the boat. Yeah, um, well. Yeah, but, there's yeah a, so yeah, I kind of just got, if you want to call that lucky. Yeah. Well, you know what I yeah. mean. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I mean, at the time, yeah. you considered yourself lucky. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? at the time. And yeah. there's actually, I, I heard there's a new documentary about Camden being like big drug capital at one point in the 70s and how the Colombians would be dropping barrels into the Delaware and then, you know, oh, yeah. people would have to go into the Delaware and fish the barrels out and that would be filled with all the product. I I, I used to get the stories about when he was younger with uh, the cocaine and, and some people. Um, but literally, uh, we had stuff, not me personally, he and him, his brother had stuff coming over and like furniture and Goya cans and motorcycle helmets, like things of that nature, like being shipped right through the mail, you know? Can I ask, can I ask, can I ask or take it out? Like I can edit it out, like which gang or which affiliation? Okay. So, um, personally, uh, the guy I was dating was not affiliated at all with any gang. His other was a blood. And his oldest brother uh, wasn't affiliated with a gang either. They just had that clout and that respect and had a lot of backup. So, like, they would go in and take over blocks from people you know, and start running them themselves. So it's only a matter of time, you know, as they get older and the younger ones are coming up, that it happens to them as yeah. well. So um, when he came home from jail, you know, the guy's nowhere to be found, doesn't want to talk. Um, I'm sitting in the car outside of the store on um, 8th and Bailey in an alleyway, and um uh, my boyfriend at the time brings me a coffee and I had my seat all the way back because I was doing something in the back seat. I wasn't getting high at the time. Um, and he got in the car and he handed me my coffee and I turned it around and he said, oh shit, there's Haleen. And I'm like, who is that? Like, what is what does that mean? Like, who is that? And, you know, I had noticed the guy walk by me front and I turned and looked and all three of them are lined up to start firing at my car. My car was hit 15 times. Um, and again, by the grace of God, I got out of that alleyway because I couldn't see over the steering wheel because I, like I said, my feet happened to be all the way back. So I was doing something in the back seat. So he laid on my lap and I was leaned all the way back. So I couldn't even see out the windshield. I knew there was a dumpster in front of me, but then there was a dumpster on the left too. So I had to like swerve and every like to get out of there. Like so again, divine intervention like, for me not being able to see, getting out of that alleyway untouched, um, was crazy in itself. My car was hit fifteen times. A bullet came straight through the back of the passenger seat, headrest into the um, dashboard. So had he been sitting up, his brains would have been splattered in front of me. And for a second, he thought he was hit because the coffee spilled on him. All he felt was hotness. And he was like ripping his mask off, like I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And then, so I'm rushing to the hospital now, like doing a hundred down 7th Street towards Cooper, you know. And, um, I got pulled over right at Northgate, and it turned out he wasn't, thank God, um, but the, you know, the cops impounded the car, of course, and he has literally said to me 15 minutes before this happened, because he had uh, a gun himself, he said, I don't feel right, he said, I'm going to go put this up, and uh, we went, and he put the gun up. So thank God like, there was put it away. Put it away in, in the house. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't in my car. That's good. This way it was just like you guys were out and then you got attacked. Yeah. Yeah. 
that we spent hours in the police station, hours. And I got up and walked out at a certain point because I'm like, you know, I, I did something wrong. Like, if you guys aren't charging me, I'm leaving. And they were like, sit the fuck down. Cuff me to the chair. And, I mean, they had me in there for must have been like 14 hours trying to like get information out of me. And what I, year was I, this? I don't know what happened. Um, this started, um, I had to be that beginning around 2012. So it was still Camden City Cops. This is before they switched yeah. over to sheriffs. Because I yeah. think it was like 2014 or yeah. 13. 2013, they had fired all the officers. <laughs> For those yeah. who don't know, Camden was so corrupt at one point that oh, the entire police department, the entire yeah. city police department got fired. And yeah. ever since then, it's been ran by the Camden County Sheriff's Department. And usually... And they did a hell of a job cleaning it up. They, usually, they, it's within two years, you have to, like, transfer out, too. Like, they don't want to even... They don't even want you there for too long. Cause they don't want you getting comfortable right. And like, right. you're like, all right, go to a suburb now, leave. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you've been here a couple of years. You could be shady. Go, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, you know, not yeah, everybody. And they, they changed a lot of the ways the streets went. So, yeah. like, there was one way in, one way out. They yeah. would come and line up and do their roll call in the street. They used to leave. I mean, there was no time that the block was not being watched by a cop one would turn off and another one would turn on so the way they had to sell drugs became so different like yeah. they were running around scattered i remember one day looking out the window and i'm like holy shit i'm like do you see the cops on the roof they run on the roof watching down below so like i went over to the guys and i'm like yo i said don't look up but um there's cops on the roof watching you and uh, after that, like, I mean, they were it, it, it was crazy. It was crazy because they were still trying to do what they did to make money. And, you know, the cops were, they definitely shut it down. Yeah. They shut down they've been, <laughs> yeah, they've been all over that. I remember when I first got my driver's license, uh, like I said, I grew up next town over pretty much outside of Camden. Mm -hmm. And my teacher, I was always an in school suspension because I was always cutting class and just leaving because I just wanted to either smoke a cigarette or not be there, uh, <laughs> you know, and I just I just didn't want to be there. So I left all the time. They would get me in school suspension. And our in school suspension teacher was an ex Camden cop. And he was like oh, a wow. he was like a bodybuilder, like this just jack dude that you always saw walking out of the gym, just a huge guy. But he wasn't intimidating. He was the nicest guy in the world. Um, yeah. And I remember I got my license, and he was like, listen, if you ever get lost in Camden, that's how he started the sentence. I'm like, I have no <laughs> intentions of going to Camden, Mr. Martino. He's like, listen, you're going you're gonna to be going to the mall, and you're going to make a wrong turn, and you're going to end up in Camden. So when that happens, this is, because yeah. this is before GPSs, you know, this was 2003, yeah. 2003. He goes, so when that happens, you got to safely run red lights and make sure a cop <laughs> sees you. And then you tell them that Tony Martino said to keep running red lights and they're going to give you directions out. I said, okay, sure. And sure as shit, within like three months, I was going to the Cherry Hill Mall and, you know, that whole 38 and everything right there. And next thing you know, you're, you're in Camden. And he's right. I was on Broadway. And I was like, fuck you. And, you know, it's in the middle of the day. And I was right by the courthouse, you know, where like the CBS yeah. is and all and the cop yeah. was sitting right there in the corner of the courthouse. And, like, we made eye contact, and I blew through that light <laughs> <laughs> on Broadway. And I just kept going. When's the next one? I blew through that. He's behind me. He still didn't even light me up yet. And the third light, he finally <clears throat> turned his lights on. And he comes up. He goes, what the hell are you doing? I, we saw each other. I, you saw me. We saw each other see each other. And then you ran red lights. What are you doing? <laughs> I was like, listen, man, I was going to the mall, and Tony Martino's my teacher. He told me to run red lights if I got lost, and you would give me directions. He goes, oh, Tony, I love Tony. Yeah, actually, follow me out of here, and I'll get you back on money from Av. So I was like, all right. Nice. <laughs> you got but yeah, like that was like my first time going to K And then I ended up going to Camden because I could be, you know, 16 or 17 and buy an alcohol. You could go to the corner yeah. stores, and they weren't carding you. And then you get robbed because I got robbed a lot in 
Hampton too. That's for sure. But never at the sets. Whenever I went up to the set, it was always just straight business. Yeah. They didn't yeah. want stuff like that happening. That was interfering with business. You know, yeah, like, yeah, they want to move along. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think the last time I was there was 2011. And, you know, there, like, at a set. And it's because it was my friend's birthday, and I hit her up to say happy birthday. And she's like, actually, can you give me a ride home? And I was from work, and I'm like, yeah. And I hadn't talked to her. I was high on pills at the time. And I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm awake, sure. It's like 11 o'clock at night. And so she gives me directions, and it's she was on the street. She was working on the street. So yeah. I picked her up, and she's like, um, can we make a stop? And yeah. I said, okay. And she's giving me directions again, and then I realized where we were stopping as we were stopping. And mm-hmm. I forget what she called out. Was it fire and ice? Is that what she said? I forget. I was high. I think she said yeah. fire and ice. Probably and, the name of camp, right? Yeah, and yeah. yep, and then she was shooting up next to me in a car, and I was just like, "All right, so this is my, you know, Thursday night or whatever." <laughs> and yeah. she was like, "Sorry about all that. Like, you know, I'll fuck you if you want." And I was like, "No thanks. Like, it's okay." <laughs> I was like, you know, happy birthday. <laughs> like, I was wow. so high. You know, I was so high. It's not like it was gonna work anyway. Uh, you know, right, my, right, right. <laughs> myself. I was like, "No, yeah, I'll just, I'll just take you home." Right. <laughs> all right so now like you know th- now you're just getting high on dope right while all this is happening like you're high on heroin i was i was clean at okay the time in the beginning with him um like when you quit coke that night from that divine intervention you were just like i'm done with all drugs okay so uh the shootouts and all that happened first okay all right okay uh, the divine intervention occurred later on. Okay. Um, so that year, and it was crazy because I, yeah, it had to be 2012. There was like four Friday the 13th that year. I don't know if you remember, there was one year there was a lot of Fridays. 2012 through. was the worst. Like, one of my best friends died in a car accident. Another friend from school died. Both of my grandfathers died within two weeks. And then, which one was it? Hurricane Sandy came through in 2012 as well and just fucked shit up. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. 2012 was just such a fucked year when it comes to, like, yeah. that's when I started doctor shopping. So, <laughs> like, I was, like, really getting into, like, I was going to this shady place over, like, in, like, uh, Maple Shade area, I think it was, like, up there. It was, like, a house I was going into, you know what I mean? Oh, and it was wow. cash only. Yeah. And you, the referral was you had to know somebody that went there, not another doctor. Like, you had to, like, know a patient that went there. Okay. <laughs> it was so oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> but, yeah, so 2012, I mean, that was a crazy, crazy year. So, yeah, you're right. That was, yeah. that makes sense. So, total shootouts for that year were 15, and I was in seven of them. Wait, um, you were in seven shootouts that year? Yeah. Not me personally firing, you know, but, but being, you were shot because at because I was with him. Yes, I was shot at. Um, were you hit at all so in those seven different times? Um, uh, no, no, not my body. My car, I had another car that was hit twice. Now, this now, this day was broad daylight, they were both daylight. So, 15 times that my car got hit was a morning. And the other time my other car got hit was in the afternoon. And um, they were shooting at each other. And as soon as I made a right onto uh, 9th Street, there's a cop parked right there. Like, so he had to hear the bullet, you know? So, like, my boyfriend is kind of yelling at me, like, drive faster, drive faster, because now there's a gun in the car you know, and we were going to get pulled over, you know, but I can only drive so fast to not look, you know, guilty. I mean, it's and there's potholes everywhere. Really, there's only so fast you can drive. Like, those roads are Right, what am I supposed to hit 100? And then you definitely know it will, you know? Yeah, like, I feel like they don't don't fix the streets on purpose because then you can't speed. Like, they, if they make the streets flawless, then everyone can fly. 
but if there's potholes galore, then you have to take your time. Like, and I feel like that's why they just don't give a shit. <laughs> so, yeah, I can, I can see that. You can only drive so fast. All right, so the cop's behind you now, right? Yeah, so a couple blocks up, he puts his lights on. I hurry up, I make a right, and we pull up at his mom's house. He runs in the house, dashes the gun, and comes back out. By that time, the cop already has me out the car, questioning me, what's going on? You know, I'm just playing stupid, I don't know. You know, um, he's like, what's wrong with your tire? Because one of the bullets hit the tire. I was like, oh, my God, but, you know, I must have a flat, you know, like trying to play it off. Um, they took him to the police station that day. They didn't take me. Um, and then uh, another time that we were together, we were sitting on his mother's porch on a Sunday, probably like late morning, early afternoon. And someone came around the corner that we both didn't know and just started shooting at us, literally, from 10 feet away. And, like, we had to hit the ground and crawl inside. And um, and that still wasn't the worst. That was the worst one for me. That's the first one. And that, that one's the worst one for me. Uh, the worst one for him was he was outside of his brother's store one day and I heard the gunshots from I was at home and I heard all the gunshots and I said oh my god he's dead you know so I like ran out the house and as I'm running out the house he's running to the house and that was the day his family was like you guys have to leave like they're going to kill you and um I said what do you mean I have no money to leave you know like and uh, she was like, his brother's wife was like, you need to call your mom, you know, and I'm like, I can't call my mom and tell my mom this stuff, you know, I barely spoke to my mom during that time, though we lived in the same state, you know, I would shoot her a text and let her know I was okay every once in a while, but she had no clue how I was living, you know, and uh, so his brother's wife got on the phone with my mom and said, you know, I know you don't live this lifestyle she's like but i'm telling you today if you do not get your daughter out of this state they are going to kill her and we left on a bus to georgia and my cousin um with a couple subs kicking the whole way down you know you and your boyfriend yeah so he had never used uh heroin though he sold it um he had used perk you know and smoked a lot of weed and pcp but um uh, what i started you guys you yeah. guys call yeah that i, I don't but, think that expression is everywhere but every time i've said to somebody i'm like oh yeah i've gotten tricked into smoking wet a couple times and they're like yeah. wet i'm like pcp and they're like yeah i don't know i'm like never mind i'm i'm an asshole <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I was trying to hide my using, and, um, you know, uh, he found out I was using, and he was like, well, I want to feel what you feel, you know, he had found everything, the needles, I wasn't, um, like, name mining, but I was skin popping, like, just putting it into my muscle, and, um, so he went to the mark, you know, and, um, from growing up in that place, he, he had watched people, you know, he had given samples to people and watched them set it up and all that. So he knew how to do all that. And he said, well, if you don't do it for me, I'm going to do it myself. So he set it up and I'm like, I don't care. I, well, I did care, but I was like, I'm not doing it for you. Like, there's no way in hell I'm doing it for you. And he starts trying to like do it. And, and I'm seeing that like, he's going to get it right. You know what I mean? So I'm like, just give it to me. And he handed it to me and I just jabbed him in the leg with it. And he got all pissed off at me, you know, but um, I, I didn't want him to, to do it that way. You know, it's, it's a big difference from muscle popping to actually name mine, you know? So, um, yeah, our habits took off. 
down in Georgia, though. Like now you're no that ha- that had happened here during the shootout. Um, like I said, not for the first couple, but like eventually. And I think I turned to drugs because of the trauma. You know, yeah, that is traumatic. I mean, yeah, you know, you yeah. almost die seven times in a year. Right. Like that's not everybody's year. Yeah. Okay, so I never you, thought someone like me would ever be in a situation like that, you know, ever. So now you're both with withdrawing on the way to Georgia, mm-hmm. because he had already started to shoot. Now is what you're saying. So oh yeah, now that he's been shooting and you've been shooting, you know, obviously you're going to withdraw a lot quicker. So, but you only have a couple subs, so that's not going to last you, but like two or three days. Right. Uh, when we got down to Georgia, he made a phone call and uh, had somebody send some in the mail, send a couple more in the mail. And uh, so needless to say, it wasn't the most comfortable detox, but it, it wasn't terrible either. So you had more subs sent to you in the mail? Yes. No, so you didn't use down there then? You didn't use any heroin in Georgia? No. What they called dope was weed. Dope to them was weed. I'm like, what? Why would you call weed dope, right? <laughs> I mean, there's been people I've talked to that called meth or crank dope. You know what I mean? Everyone yeah. calls, like, Everything you know, it depends. Yeah. Everything's in a different area. It depends on when also. Mm-hmm. So is 2012 your first bout of sobriety that you had? So, by the time we went to Georgia, I, yeah, like towards the end of 2012, yeah. And then that's when you put together five years? Um, you said you had five years of sobriety at one point? Yes, yes. Okay, I had five years prior to him. Oh, okay, from okay, like high school. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, when we got together, um, I actually knew uh, one of his older brothers, which is how we met. So I wasn't um, using when we met. Okay, so you... I met him through friends at a bar, and yeah. Um, Or like this little dance club thing in Philly is where we actually met. Okay, I see. Yeah. So you, the first time you had five years clean, it was like in between sure. your. Yeah. Okay, and then you went used again. So how much? How long did you stay clean for when you got down to Georgia? Um. So you know, we were in like the country of Georgia, like no, they had dirt roads, no light. Uh one or two sheriff's offices for the town. The closest thing was a Walmart that was 45 minutes away. So there was, like, no use at all. Yeah. There was no opportunity. There was, like, we both, you know, were down there without a car or anything. So, like, how were we going to get jobs? So we went and stayed with his cousin in Florida, which wasn't much better, but um, we were both able to get some jobs. But his cousin was crazy as hell, so it ended up not working out. Um, and we had to leave Florida with literally the clothes on our back. Um, so we were gone for probably about maybe like four to six months we were gone. And in that time frame, uh, the guy that was fighting for him, over the block was killed. So, uh, it was basically safe to go back. Yeah. yeah. So then you had it back now. So we had it back. Um, and by then, you know, of course, his family knew we were using. Um, so Drugs weren't as available as they once were because we had burned a lot of bridges. Uh, a lot of bridges. Like, stuff people would probably come kill you for today. Like, 
but they didn't because it was his family, you know. Um, we robbed a lot of uh, sets out there, but like I said, his family was so well known and so untouchable that they knew if they did anything to either one of us, like retaliation was coming. So, you know, they would they would see me come and I would kind of scope it out and, and buy something and watch where they were stashing it and then send him over to basically take it or he would stick them up or he would do whatever he needed to do to get one more. And uh, so he eventually, through all that, uh, ended up getting locked up. And in hindsight, like, that's what needed to happen. Um, And I got tired of him getting locked up, you know? Like, my life got put on hold every time he got locked up. And uh, in the process of him being locked up, I had lost my father and one of his wishes was that I will go back to him. So I did like hold him down the whole time he was in prison. Um, But the day he came home, I because he kept her Oh, he's confusing me because I mean, everybody turned to call me. And I guess he eventually moved on. And hopefully he's alive and hopefully he looks different and hopefully he's clean. You know, but I, I really don't know. That's not your concern now. So right. now this, and then I'm assuming that's when you came back and that's when you finally like tried sobriety out for the first time. Like not for the first time, but like yeah. Yeah. more of a serious like run at it. And is that when you got into programs like AA and stuff? So, no, I was in and out of NA throughout this whole time, in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, Never fully surrendering to the program, Um, not getting a sponsor, not working steps, just attending meetings, you know, had a sponsor and made mistake only, you know, didn't call her, didn't, didn't, you know, work any steps at that time. Um, for uh, the five years, I did have a sponsor and work the steps. Um, but like as I started getting my life back, I started pulling away from me and getting disconnected and all that. And um, every time, that's how it works. Every time, like when I do that, I would you know, get these things that recovery afforded me and little by little start pulling away, you know, because life became so busy, I didn't have time and I thought I was good and I thought I had a good foundation, you know, and then I stopped using my network and then like life would show up and I would be disconnected. Um, And the last thing to like take me out, um, I had big time issues with grief. Like I said, I had lost my father. I was eight months clean when he died. And it was tragic and sudden. And we weren't expecting it. And uh, I tried my hardest to stay clean. And everybody kept saying, you gotta be strong for your mom. You gotta be strong for your mom. But inside I'm crying like he's gonna be strong for me, you know? And I had broken up with my sponsor um, so I felt like I kept sharing about it at meetings but like it wasn't getting any better you know what I mean and I just wanted some relief I, I, grief was something I had a huge issue with um, and for the next five years straight I literally lost somebody very close to me almost every year and uh, it all became too much and I ended up uh, eventually using this last time and uh, 
So when I got clean, I had a lot of grief to deal with, a lot. And uh, and not only the grief of losing people, but the grief of a relationship ending, the grief of the drug, because you have to, you know, the drug was there. Oh, that, I, I always say that 30s were my first love. Yeah. Uh, the grief of losing my apartment, uh, not knowing where I was going to go. You know, I, had, I, I thought I was going to be homeless trying to be clean on the streets. And I'm like, how is this going to work? Like, I don't, I don't know how it's going to work. And finally, um, my mother did open her doors for me to come back. Um, and she knew I was clean. So, um, that was the last go round. And then I've been given so much grief, like through these last couple months that like, I was going to say, I, what's different now? I deal now? with it better. I yeah. deal with it better today. Because um, my thing I, was grief, so, too. That was, like, yeah. my, my trauma and my reason for getting high was always grief. And okay. I realized that, like, your mind or our minds are, like, muscles that you can't see. And right. the more you go through that grief without any drugs or alcohol, it like, going to the gym for our mind, and it makes our mind stronger. So each right. time it happens it gets a little bit easier to live with, not deal with because it's like they're gone still, but like live with the fact right. that we can't bring them back. Right. You know, that's what I've been learning because grief and sobriety is a lot different thing. Cause like, you know, <laughs> who wants to feel yeah. things? Right. <clears throat> so many, so many different emotions when you're grieving. Um, but I, uh, I have the strong, faith in God and I found God through um, in a jail cell in Florida to be honest in a jail cell in Florida um, I ended up going to Wisconsin to a family member and then having this guy again that I gave I gave it some real winners you know uh, the drug dealer, and he was, uh, I had lied to him and told him I went to rehab. So he's like, where are you at? I'll come get you, you know? And I'm like, uh, I'm in Wisconsin. Sure enough, this guy gets in his car from New Jersey and drove to Wisconsin to come get me. And, uh, then we ended up in Florida at his family's house, and he was just no good. He was no good. Um, he was trying to set me up to look like something I wasn't because he was facing a lot of trouble. Um, all of this had come out. Um, we got into a huge argument and basically his family stranded me on the side of the road, took my purse, took my phone, threw a hundred dollars at me and that was it. And I had given his mother just the day prior $400 for rent. Like, $100 wasn't going to get me back to New Jersey. And you guys took my phone, like, and my ID, and my purse. Like, so I, um, the only thing I had on me was, like, a phone that didn't work anymore, So, but I could use it in Wi-Fi. And I called a friend, and uh, they wired me. $800, but now I can't pick it up because I don't have an ID. So I had to wait in a parking lot, find somebody to pick it up. And they picked it up for me. And um, I was using in Florida. Um, so I got a hotel room. I stayed up all night. I um, was on anxiety medication at the time. And I bought alcohol. And we all know how, how well they go together. So the next morning I said, I need to go buy a phone, you know, before I leave. So I like to call it a brownout because I was still walking. I wasn't completely blacked out, but like it was a brownout. So I'm in Walmart. I buy the phone and I'm like, well, you know what? I might need some stuff to do on the bus. So I'm like walking around Walmart and like shopping. <laughs> and I go through the self-checkout and, I've watched the videos to it. Like, 
I'm so inebriated, like, I can't find the barcodes on everything. So I just start getting irritated and throwing shit in the bag. And on my way out, I get stopped, you know, before I even exited the store fully. And I'm like, but you don't understand. Like, I have all this money. And I pulled out, like, all this money. And I'm like, can I just pay for it, please? And they didn't let me pay for it. The cops are waiting outside for me. And I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be like Jersey. They're going to process and let me go. And I'm out of here. Nope. I sat in jail, like, the highest bail I've ever had. Like, a $52,000 bail. Yeah. So I got arrested by two male police officers. Um, I had prescriptions in my pocket for um, Suboxone and Klonopin. They were both my prescriptions. Um, and I had told the guy, because I also went to the Walmart to get a drink to take my medicine that day. And um, I told the guy I had it in my pocket, but they wouldn't uncuff me to get it out to hand it to them so i'm trying with handcuffs on behind me to go in my pocket with one finger to grab out four pills and it just didn't work um so i get in the cop car um i fell asleep on the way like i said i was awake all night drinking mixing anxiety medications and uh So I get out of the cop car inside the jail and the, some, uh, a pill fell out of my pocket and he, he goes up add another one, like another charge. So now I have introduction to contraband, um, possession of CDS and, um, along with shoplifting. And I didn't know this at the time, but um, the guy I had went down there with his mother had pressed assault charges on me. And we never, we had an altercation, but I never touched her. She actually tried to swing at me and I like dipped back and she ended up like knocking my phone out of my hand. Um, I ended up backing up, like, so she's, like, coming at me all around the back, like, she had a pool, an in-ground pool in the backyard, and, you know, we're arguing, and her son came in the backyard and immediately grabbed me, like I was the aggressor, and I wasn't, um, but I guess so that I wouldn't come back to her house, you know, this is before they stranded me on the side of the road, she pressed those charges. So I didn't even know about that. I had no idea I even had those charges. But I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be like Jersey. They're going to process me. They're going to let me out. And I'm going to go about my way. So I go to the bail hearing court. And when I hear my bail, I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, what did I do? Like, $52,000 is, like, crazy. And um, so somebody in the um oh god what's it called when they first told you like this the lockdown when you first go into jail um was like this is a border state so like when you get in trouble here everything's like uh more penalized and i'm like what are we border the water (laughs) and they're like yeah i guess I'm like, well, that's so weird because had I done the same thing in New Jersey, it would have been a misdemeanor. So now I'm in jail. My mother won't speak to me. Uh, I know nobody from the area. Um, And I have all these feelings coming up because not only am I coming off of drugs, I'm coming off of Suboxone also. Um, and Father's Day is approaching, the death of my father's anniversary is approaching, and I'm losing it. Like, I'm broken, completely broken in this jail, and going through it physically. Um, and they don't give you anything down there. Like up here now, they give you like a little something, you know, like Librium or something like that. 
they don't give you anything down there. And I, I, I mean, I was pleading for Tylenol and the nurse could tell by my blood pressure. She's like, Oh my God. She's like, your blood pressure indicates pain. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in a lot of pain. Like I would sit up night after night, after night, after night, not being able to sleep. Finally, um, I would sleep like maybe 10, 15 minutes at a time at like maybe three months, you know, um, eventually in the beginning I would get so tired. I would fall asleep, but it was never restful sleep. You know, um, it took about a full six months of cold Turkey and everything to finally be able to sleep. But, um, so I have all these feelings, all this grief coming up and, um, I was like, you know what, let me go to church and, uh, like try to do something to feel better, do something productive. I had signed up for like substance abuse classes. They didn't have NA or AA or anything like that. It was just substance abuse classes and they were packed. So I couldn't get into them, but I went to church and little by little, like I would feel better when I came out. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to look at God as my father you know, to help me get through this hard time because I had nobody, literally like nobody would answer the phone for me. And I had, you know, sometimes when you go to jail up, you know, when you're around, when you live around someplace, you know, somebody in there, you know, so they can kind of like be there for you. But I knew nobody, you know, um, and it was there in a jail cell that, um, like I truly found God and I ended up having an experience of speaking in tongues and I didn't know what was happening to me. I had no idea. All I knew was I had found peace and joy beyond any like explanation. And I saw beauty everywhere, like around me. And, um, I started getting books from the library, like trying to like figure out, I knew something spiritual was taking place, but I I didn't know what it was. And, um, then this lady came into jail, um, who used to, um, she was a lesbian. She was taking hormones to become a man. And found Christ. Like, her her family was very, like, into, like, they were Baptist. And um, she would go to church and all that. And um, she ended up convulsing on the floor and speaking in tongues. And from that day forward, she stopped taking the hormones. She stopped being a lesbian. Um, And so this lady became my friend. And I had told her, like, what happened to me. And she said, honey, you were baptized by the spirit. She said, now it doesn't take away everything, you know, because she still herself, she still struggled with temptation, you know, especially being in an all woman jail, you know, like that's her temptation right there. And so she would still struggle with it, but she didn't act on it. And, um, I came home by the grace of God, I got out of that state. I don't even, uh, I had uh, a girl I shared a cell with, you know, promise. She gave me her number. She's like, I'm going to help you. And, and, you know, people always say they're going to help you and I'm going to make this phone call for you. And I, and and like, so I kind of like half believed her, but, um, she, she sure helped me. Like she helped me. She helped me get out of there. And it just so happened. Um, my cousin was back in Georgia bringing her children to see their father. So I got a ride out of Florida to Georgia. And then, um, from Georgia, I connected with, um, somebody in New Jersey, a couple people in New Jersey to help me get out of Georgia. And I ended up in a sober home, um, in New Jersey. And first I went to a, a male friend's house. But I didn't know, you know, he claimed he just wanted to help me, but, uh, he had more in mind than that, you know, uh, and, and I, naively believed him, you know, 
I'm like, oh, well, he must be working a program. He just wants to give back. And, like, you know, but, you know, he wanted more than that. And, and I wasn't willing to do that. You know, I, I was living my life differently. And um, so he kicked me out. And that's how I ended up in the sober home. And then I still had, like, stupid little warrants for, like, not paying fines and stuff like that. And I had gotten stopped for not using a crosswalk. And I um, was honest with the cop. I was like, I got warrants, you know. And they locked me up on all of them, which was okay. But they kicked me out of the sober home because of it. And um, my mother opened her doors to me again. Um, which I didn't think she would do, but she did. And, and I did well for three years, but uh, the area that I'm in, uh, lacks females and then it lacks willing females to sponsor in NA. So I had a difficult time finding a sponsor and at that time, you know, with years clean, you know, like a year clean, 18 months clean, I would think something was wrong with me when I, when I felt like I wanted to use, and I wouldn't share that. I wouldn't share about that, but that's exactly where my addiction wanted me. You know, I thought something was wrong with me. I have this amount of time clean. Why am I still thinking this way? Not knowing because I didn't have a sponsor or a solid network that that's okay, you know, and yeah. that we, we share about stuff like that and, you know, it dies in the light of exposure and, and all that. So I, I held all that stuff in, you know, and I was always very hard on myself. I would hear people share these like awesome things in meetings and I'm like, I can't compare to that. I can't, you know, what do, what do I have to give? You know, what do I have to share? And, and, um, so I sat there with my mouth shut, you know, not getting to the exact nature of what was going on in my life. And, um, I got into a relationship with someone that was, um, lying about clean time that was, recently out of a relationship that really had no business being in a new relationship. But by the time I found out all these things, I was already, I already had feelings. And I was like, well, I wouldn't want someone to leave me because of this. So I stuck around, you know, thinking I can help. I can help pull him up. But that's not true either. You try to pull someone up and they pull you down. go down. Yeah, in no way am I blaming my addiction, my last run on him. In no way. Because I made the choice to use. Yeah. But we, uh, 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 What's that? Hold on, hold on. Things in life. Yeah. Hold on, you said he what now? I said, um, again, recovery had afforded me these things in life. Like, you know, a job, a car, a car restored relationships with family um and the relationship we had in the beginning was beautiful like was great um we used to go to church together and I remember I had prayed to God because my thing was never to date in the rooms ever like that was a no-no for me because I had watched it end badly for other people you know um but I prayed to God and I was like, you know, just send me a, a man that goes to church, you know? And uh, so I was very vague <laughs> about it. And um, we were talking after a meeting and one of our mutual friends kind of threw us together and was like, hey, and I, I didn't tell anybody about this prayer that I had sent out. He was like, hey, you know, he goes to the same church as you. And it was like literally the next day. And I was like, wow, like, is God answering my prayers? You know, it's the first relationship that I ever seen God's hand on. And um, so, like I said, it it was beautiful in the beginning when we weren't using, but we both began using at a certain point and it went to hell. It went to hell. And um, 
No, when you went back to use them, was it dope? Yes. Yes. And, um, but I don't know if you're aware, but there is like no longer heroin on the streets. I searched everywhere for it. I said, where is the brown dope? I don't want this new stuff, this fentanyl. You know, because I had gotten out of the game years prior, like, as it really started hitting the streets big. Yeah. And um, the best I could find was a mixture, like a half and half heroin and fentanyl. And so I started doing that. And then all of a sudden, it switched to straight fentanyl. Now, this is um, a beast like no other. It is nothing compared to heroin. Um, The high is different. Um, wasn't what I was looking for, but the withdrawal, I don't know if you can curse on there. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can. The withdrawal was a motherfucker. Like, the longest, most painful, most intense withdrawal ever. And, um, I've lost more friends to this stuff than I can, like, and and recently, fairly recently. Oh, yeah, me too. You know, yeah. like, like when they used to say to use is to die in the rooms years ago, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think I had known one person that died from a heroin overdose throughout my whole addiction. And, um, like, but truly, like, I get what that means now. Like, to use yeah. is to die. I've lost so many, so many friends. All the people I started using with that I went to high school with are gone. You know, um, I've seen many people walk out of the meetings thinking they had one more die. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's especially in Jersey too. When like you went to a, you were in Lumberton, so you went to the, one of the regional schools then. Yeah. Yeah, so you had like four thousand kids in your school, so I'm sure like we I was in a school with you know a graduating class of less than two hundred, and we're still losing people all the time. Oh wow! You know, so I'm sure your school, you know, people you went to school with is even worse or just up there because you know it yeah. doesn't doesn't matter. Right. Doesn't matter if you have money or if you're broke, if you're living on the streets or if you have a mansion. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Doesn't so matter. what made you stop this time? Um, I was so done. I was so done before I ever even quit. I used to say when I had lost my job to COVID, um, you know, we were struggling before that to make ends meet and keep up with an addiction. And I said, you know, when I lost my job, I said, we need to do something like we need to get clean. Like we, we need to do something. And his thing was, we'll manage. We'll manage. So he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready up until the day he went to rehab. Um, But I fought tooth and nail to get him into rehab. Um, I myself had been to six detoxes prior to actually getting him into rehab and I don't know had situations been reversed if he would have done the same for me but it doesn't really matter because that's the type of person I am but I kept putting myself basically like in the belly of the beast by coming out of detox going back home to him putting myself around him and I would use not because he forced it on me, you know, it was my choice, but, um, finally, finally, I I knew if I left him there, he was going to die. He was going to die in our apartment by himself. So like for the last six months, I didn't really live there. I, I stayed with my mom, but now my mom's sick and tired because I've been to, six detoxes like in six months you know and um so we talked the whole time he was in rehab and you know he was we're gonna make it we're gonna get through this three days before his release I love you 
we're gonna get through this. Uh, he was released the day before my birthday. I didn't hear from him on my birthday. And um, I was like, something's not right. And I popped up on him at his mom's. And I had told him while he was in rehab, I think you should go to your mom's when you come home, just for a little bit. He had some health issues to handle and stuff like that. And what better place to be than with mom when you're not feeling good, you know? But um, before he went to rehab, he was on his hands and knees, like crying and begging me to not tell his family that he was going to rehab. And like, they weren't stupid. They already knew we were using, you know? And I knew that in recovery, he would want his family. So I betrayed his trust and I told them, I involved them. And um, he, like I said, he came home, didn't call me. I popped up on him at his family's. The way his family treated me, I already knew. Like I already knew inside what was about to take place. And uh, I spoke to him and he said, I need to figure things out. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I'm not a figure it out kind of girl. Like, you're with me or you're not with me. Like, there's, like, how are you, like, half with somebody? You know what I mean? Like, so I basically, you know, because I guess he didn't want to hurt my feelings, had to force it out of him. And um, then it became very, very difficult because the apartment was technically his. But, and his family was blocking me from talking directly to him. But we had built a life together in the three years we were together. So, like, there needed to be some things divided. And it was hard to do through his sister, through a third party. And it was frustrating to me. And some of his other family members weren't as nice to me. And I'm already broken. I'm already just trying to get another day clean. And here's everybody shitting on me. And basically, you know, if you imagine a million broken pieces of glass on the ground, like taking the hammer and breaking them pieces of glass is even more. Like, I was losing my mind. Like, my heart was broken. This came out of left field to me. Um... I was left to clean up his mess. Like, you're an adult man, and I'm here cleaning your mess up. Moving this stuff out of the apartment, you know? And then I'm like, well, what do you want done with your stuff? Nothing. Throw it all out. You know? I said, you're going to regret that. I said, there's no reason you need to lose everything again. You know? Um, so I packed his stuff up, and his sisters came and got it. And, like, it's so funny because we are friendly today. Uh, we speak to each other in meetings. Um, he had a Jason Aldean hat from a concert that uh, his sister won tickets to and got, like, backstage passes. And Jason Aldean signed the hat. <laughs> like, you never would have had that opportunity had I not packed up your stuff and given you your hat back. You know? So... It was hard to be the bigger person, you know, and I probably didn't handle all things as well as I should, but I was very spiritually ill, you know, especially during active addiction and then trying to just get another day clean in the beginning was difficult in itself. And then yeah. all these roadblocks, like people were making things more difficult than it needed to be. And um, I, I didn't understand that at the time. You know, I, I didn't understand, like, what I did so wrong for, you know, like, I never thought in a million years I would be treated the way I was treated. And, um, but today, like, I empathize. I, I put myself in other people's shoes and I don't harbor resentments. Um, I forgive them, you know. They were trying to protect their son, their brother. But guess what? I'm not the person that you need to be protecting him from. 
you know, there's something, a force out there bigger than me that gripped him up way before me. You know, I was the one with three years clean. And he was the one with like three months clean, you know, maybe three months, you know. Um, so he's about to celebrate six months. It's the longest he's ever had. And um, so it's pretty, it's pretty damn awesome to see that. Um, and I just wish him the best, you know. And you're getting, and you're getting there too. I mean, you're getting your yeah. time back. I mean, yeah. you're you're through the hardest part. Right. And it sounds like you're at least working a program now. You're talking yeah. to your sponsor. It sounds like you're talking to meetings now. Yeah. Basically doing all the opposite of what you did before. Oh yeah. Biggest. Um, I've definitely surrendered. Um, and like when I came into recovery, like this time around, I went after it. Like I chased my drugs. That's what you have to do. That's how and, it works. You yeah. have to want, you have to want, and I've talked about this so many times, but you have to want sobriety as bad as you want to be high. Right. If, right. If, if you don't want to be sober just as bad as you want to be high, it's not going to work. Right. Maybe you can, you know, abstain for five years, three right. years, 10 years, right. whatever. But if you still don't want to be sober, you're not going to be. It's right. as simple as that. Yeah. It's wants and needs. So as soon as you want it, it'll work. When you need it, it's not going to work. Right. So exactly. I'm. Exactly. Have you so talked, have you spoken in a meeting like as like a speaker yet? Like to tell your story? Um. Or is this like the first time you really like told your story, told your story? Um. Okay, so I spoke in a meeting when, like, in my early 20s when I had, like, no business being up there at all, mm -hmm. um, but not recently, no. Um, my home group is a California tag-type meeting, um, but we do do celebrations now, so when I get to a year, I'll be able to speak. I actually have been um, asked to speak at a meeting, but my messenger app i don't have the notifications on and i didn't get it in time and i had already made a commitment uh with another girl to go to another meeting that night oh okay so i didn't want to break that commitment but well, i have been asked to speak yeah definitely keep telling your story so yeah. i appreciate it you know what i mean and especially for recovery month it'll be up you know <laughs> for at least my page uh i'm not sure when either sometime this week or next week but okay. I'll, I'll shoot you a message before it goes up. Usually, like, before it let you know, like, hey, it's going up at midnight. Okay. So, but <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, you know, that's rough. Everything, like, so I'm so glad you're as positive about sobriety as you are because it's hard to be positive, you know, sometimes when you can't accept your past. But when you right. can accept your past, it's a lot easier to be positive about things. Right. So, and I just want to say, like, I've, I've been through some trauma. I've been raped multiple times. I've been beat. I've been verbally abused. I, I've had it rougher than most people would think looking at me. And I've been through some things um, that most people wouldn't think, you know. And any addict that's still breathing has the opportunity to recover you know to lose the desire to well to stop using lose the desire and find a new way to live and i truly believe that you know yeah i couldn't agree more like as as far gone as you think you are you can get out of it right you just have to want to get out of it right right and put in the work right because it's not going to be easy. Measures avail us nothing, you know. And, yep. And I have that in my story as well. You know, I've tried to pick and choose which suggestions to take, and you know, I've tried to do it every which way possible. It never worked. Yeah. So everything I that love didn't how work I love for me before <laughs> I do now. You know. I love how it works. That was from how it works, right? I half measures half measures of balance from AA. Yeah, no, but it's from the How It Works section of the Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Page yeah. 46, chapter yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, <laughs> chapter 5. We, we read it at every meeting in Los Angeles. 
Okay. Like at the beginning of every meeting, it's custom to read a portion from chapter five, how it works. Okay. And you read that entire section down to, you know, we strive for spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Right. So, yep. Yeah. And you're on that perfection track. Perfection doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in humans, you know? It, it's something that we can create for ourselves. Right. So right. I used to suffer from perfectionism and, and I was always disappointed and miserable because I could never live up to that standard, you know? Yeah. You created the standard though. Right. You right. created the standard that you weren't going to reach. That's the like right. fucked up thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, and your relationship with your mom today is good. You're back in the house. Is yes. that what you're at? So, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and that again, like I give that to God because she was so done. She was like six detoxes, six months. I'm done. Like you're not getting it, you know. But when she saw like I'm clean, and I think she thought like, how is she gonna survive this on the homeless on the streets, you know? And yeah, I had options. I could have went to a sober home. I could have tried to find funding, you know. Um, but would I have fought that hard given all the difficulties I was already experiencing? You know, and she knew the tough time I was having. I mean, I had to go into um, the psych ward clean because I, I was just so broken. I, I needed to, at that time away, to be mentally, like, stabilized, you know, after all I had been through. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm glad you're at where you're at now. Thank you for sitting down and talking with me and telling your story and, you Absolutely. know, being so open about it, because I know it's not easy to talk about all the time, but it does get easier to talk about each time. Yeah. You know, the more we talk about that grief and that, you know, our past, the easier it is to accept. Right. So, you right. know, pretty soon you can be, be laughing at your own mistakes and your own stories. Yeah. You know, when yeah. whenever you hear somebody laugh in the rooms, it's because they're relating. They're relating, not yeah. They're not yeah. laughing at you, they're laughing with you. Yeah. You yeah. know, and you, once you get to that point, it's a really, like, freeing feeling to laugh it at is. your past. So yeah. I'm glad you're, you know, on your way. So, again, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank Have you a good day. No too. problem at all. All right, see ya.